It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Sally here. When it comes down to the idea of Hellfire, it is by far one of the most terrifying ideas that has been stood up by humanity. Throughout many discussions and debates, many Christians will argue for something that is known as Pascal's Wager. That is to say, it is better to believe in the idea of the afterlife than not believe in the afterlife and go to hellfire. When it comes down to the numbers of people that actually believe in the idea of hellfire, the numbers are pretty interesting from the Pew Research Center. When it comes down to the belief of Hellfire, about 62% of Americans actually believe in the idea of Hellfire. That would be like over 79% of Christians who are Protestant, Evangelical, Historically Black, Catholic, White Catholic, Hispanic, they all believe in the idea of Hellfire. Well, surprisingly, when it comes down to unaffiliate, about 28% believe in the idea of Hellfire that those who self-identify as atheists, about 1% believe in hellfire, self-identify agnostics, about 14% believe in the idea of hellfire, and nothing in particular, about 39% believe in the idea of hellfire. Now, 59% of men believe in hellfire, about 65% of women believe in hellfire, those who are 18 to 29, about 55% uh, believe in Hellfire. Those who are 30 to 49 believe in Hellfire, about roughly 59%. Those who are 50 and 60, about 70% believe in Hellfire. And those who are like 65 plus also believe in Hellfire, about 62%. The question then becomes, is there any kind of rational position to believe in this idea of Hellfire? Throughout the course of the video, I will argue that the idea of hellfire is not necessarily supported within biblical texts. In Luke chapter 12 verse 5, Jesus says, I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he was killed, has a story to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. If you look into the translation notes, you will realize that the word that's being used for hell is referred to as Gehenna. At Mark chapter 9, verse 43, Jesus also said, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, the unquenchable fire. In the footnotes, it also uses the word Gehenna as part of the text. There are also many other texts where Jesus uses the word Gehenna, including Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Matthew chapter 5, verse 29, Matthew verse 5 verse 30, Matthew verse 10 verse 28, Matthew verse 18 verse 9, Matthew verse 23 15, Matthew chapter 23 verse 33, Mark chapter 9 verse 43, Mark chapter 9 verse 45, Mark chapter 9 verse 47, and so on. So the question then becomes, what exactly is Gehenna? What exactly are they talking about? According to Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 31, it says, And they had built the high places, which is in the valley of some Hanum, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did they come into my mind. And according to Isaiah 66 verse 24, it says, They shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they should be abhorrent to all flesh. Based upon the textual evidence from the Old Testament, we can see that Gehenna is not necessarily referring to a place of internal torment. It seems as though that according to the text, that Gehenna is a historical place that's in Israel where people put down the trash cans into the dumpster fire and where people were being sacrificed. But otherwise, it's not necessarily or foreign to internal torture. For example, in Luke chapter 16, verse 19, it says, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who fed spontaneously every day. And at his gate was light a poor man named Lazarus, covered with shores, who desired to be fed with what he fell with the rich man's table. Furthermore, even the dogs came and licked his shoes. 
The poor man died and was carried into the angels into Adam's side. The rich man also died was buried in Hades, being tormented, being lift his eyes and saw Adam's far off and Lazarus at his sides. And Second Peter, it also said, For if God did not spare angels when he sinned, but cast them down to the Taurus, and committed to them to the pit of darkness and reserve for judgment. Fortunately for me, I'm pretty literate when it comes down to the ideas of Greek mythology. So what exactly is Tartarus and Hades according to Greek mythology? When ghosts descend to Tartarus, the main entrance to which lies in a grove of black poplars beside the ocean stream, each is supplied by pious relatives with a coin laid under the tongue of its corpse. They are thus able to play Charon, the miser who ferries them in a crazy boat across the Styx. This hateful river bounds Tartarus on the western side and has for its tributaries Acheron, Phlegathon, Cocytus, Adonis and Lethe. Penniless ghosts must wait forever on the near bank, unless they have evaded Hermes, their conductor, and crept down by a back entrance, such as at Laconian Tenerus or Thesprotian Aeornum. A three-headed, or some say fifty-headed dog named Cerberus guards the opposite shore of Styx, ready to devour living intruders or ghostly fugitives. The first region of Tartarus contains the cheerless Asphodel fields, where souls of heroes stay without purpose among the throngs of less distinguished dead that twitter like bats, and where only Orion still has the heart to hunt the ghostly deer, None of them but would rather live in bondage to a landless peasant than rule over all Tartarus. Their one delight is in libations of blood poured to them by the living. When they drink, they feel themselves almost men again. Beyond these meadows lie Erebus and the palace of Hades and Persephone. To the left of the palace, as one approaches it, a white cypress shades the pool of Lethe, where the common ghosts flock down to drink. Initiated souls avoid this water, choosing to drink instead from the pool of memory, shaded by a white poplar, which gives them a certain advantage over their fellows. Close by, newly arrived ghosts are daily judged by Minos, Radamanthus, and Acus, at a place where three roads meet. Radamanthus tries Asiatics and Achaeus tries Europeans, but both refer the difficult cases to Minos. As each verdict is given, the ghosts are directed along one of the three roads, that leading back to the Asphodel Meadows, if they are neither virtuous nor evil, that leading to the Punishment Field of Tartarus, if they are evil, that leading to the Orchards of Elysium, if they are virtuous. Elysium, ruled over by Cronus, lies near Hades' dominions, its entrance close to the Pool of Memory, but forms no part of them. It is a happy land of perpetual day, without cold or snow, where games, music and revels never cease, and where the inhabitants may elect to be reborn on earth whenever they please. Nearby are the fortunate islands, reserved for those who have been three times born and three times attained Elysium. But some say that there is another fortunate isle called Luce in the Black Sea, opposite the mouths of the Danube, wooded and full of beasts, wild and tame, where the ghosts of Helen and Achilles hold high revelry and declaim Homer's verses to heroes who have taken part in the events celebrated by him. Hades, who is fierce and jealous of his rights, seldom visits the upper air except on business or when he is overcome by sudden lust. Once he dazzled the nymph Minthe with the splendor of his golden chariot and its four black horses and would have seduced her without difficulty, had not Queen Persephone made a timely appearance and metamorphosed Minthe into sweet-smelling mint. On another occasion, Hades tried to violate the nymph Loise, who was similarly metamorphosed into the white poplar standing by the pool of memory. He willingly allows none of his subjects to escape, and few who visit Tartarus return alive to describe it, which makes him the most hated of the gods. Hades never knows what is happening in the world above, or in Olympus, except for fragmentary information which comes to him when mortals strike their hands upon the earth 
and invoke him with oaths and curses. His most prized possession is the helmet of invisibility, given him as a mark of gratitude by the Cyclopes when he consented to release them at Zeus's order. All the riches of gems and precious metals hidden beneath the earth are his, but he owns no property above ground, except for certain gloomy temples in Greece and, possibly, a herd of cattle in the island of Erythia, which some say really belong to Helios. Queen Persephone, however, can be both gracious and merciful. She is faithful to Hades, but has had no children by him, and prefers the company of Hecate, goddess of witches, to his. Zeus himself honours Hecate so greatly that he never denies her the ancient power which she has always enjoyed, of bestowing on mortals or withholding from them any desired gift. She has three bodies and three heads, lion, dog, and mare. Tisiphone, Electo, and Megara, the Arines or Furies, live in Erebus, and are older than Zeus or any of the other Olympians. Their task is to hear complaints brought by mortals against the insolence of the young to the aged. Now, some people are familiar with some elements of Norse mythology, like, for example, they know the gods named Loki or Stor or Odin, but do you guys actually know that there's actually a goddess in Norse mythology that's actually called Hell? Now, this right here is a copy of the post Edda that goes into great detail about this particular goddess of the underworld. Hell, pronounced like the English word hell, is the most general name for the underworld where many of the dead dwell. It is presented by a fearful goddess whose name is also Hell. Occasionally, it's also referred to Hell, realm, the realm of Hell, although this is much more common in the secondary literature than in the Old Norse primary sources. Like physical graves, Hell was thought to be located underground. Some sources also place it in the north, the direction where it's cold and dark, like the grave. A dog is sometimes said to guard its entrance, like with Cerberus in Greek mythology. The name of Hell and Hell, the Christian realm of an eternal suffering ruled over by Satan, come from the same root in the proto-dramatic language, which is the ancestor of both Ornos and by the way of Old English, Modern English. The common root has been reconstructed by modern scholars as Hellos, the concealed place, and words stemming from Hellos seem to have been used to denounce the underworld in virtually all dramatic languages. We modern English speaker call the Christian concept of a land of damnation hell because the concept was called hell or hell in Old English, presumably hell hell originally word as Norse hell, and the Christian missionaries to the Anglo-Saxon used the closest word they could find in Old English to refer to Satan realm. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that a large population of Americans believe in the idea of a literal hellfire. There's actually a book about how God changed your brain, and I recommend you guys to read this book. But essentially, because of the belief of hellfire, it's actually psychologically damaging towards both kids and adults. Excessive anger or fear can permanently disrupt many structures and function in your body and your brain. These destructive emotions interfere with memory sources and cognitive accuracy. Furthermore, angers encourage your brain to defend your beliefs, be it they're right or wrong, and when this happens, you'll be more likely to feel prejudiced towards others. You'll inaccurately perceive angers in other people's faces, and this will increase your own distrust and fear. It's an insidious process that feeds on itself and can influence your behavior for long periods of time. Young children have a particular difficult time with stories describing God's anger. For example, we know that nightmares are directly related to a child's reaction towards frightening images and hostile words, and we know that images of an authoritative God increases children's anxiety, not in just Christians, but in Muslim children as well. In a study conducted in the United Arab Emirates, psychologists explored the prevalence of fear in 340 adolescents, of the 60 fear items listed, the belief in the devil and fear of bringing religious law invoke extremely negative reactions in 50% of the subjects. According to the researchers, nearly half of the children reported that the fear caused considerable distress and intervened with daily activities. 
What do you guys think about the history of hell? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.